Gold. It's fascinated the masses for generations. It's been called both the perfection of nature and the source of evil. It's been a source of power and also for destruction. It has inspired tremendous beauty and also corrupted the greedy. But today, it's inspiring something new. Hi, my name is Gabe Bauer and this is Top Shelf History, where we combine great stories with great drinks. This is the Golden Empire. It is a drink I have made for you today based, well, on gold and its role in the Incan Empire. It's made with four basic ingredients, pisco, Inca cola, maracuya, or passion fruit in English, and egg white. It's a fitting drink, I think, for the once incredible Golden Incan Empire. The story of the Incas is a fascinating but very difficult to verify tale. Why? Because they maintained most of their history through oral tradition. Much like the Greeks before them who told the stories of Odysseus and Zeus, the Incas didn't express their stories through the written language because, well, they didn't have one. Or the wheel. Or a lot of other technologies that most other civilizations would find indispensable. But that didn't stop them from building one of the largest empires in the New World prior to the Europeans coming along. At the time of its peak in the 16th century, the Incan Empire stretched from Chile all the way up to Ecuador and Colombia. It was comparable to the Ottoman Empire of the early 20th century and had around 12 million people within its borders. So with a country, an empire so large, how did it come to fall? Well, it all came down to one man named Francisco Pizarro and a whole lot of gold. You see, gold was in abundance in the country that the Incans called home. Modern day Peru is still one of the biggest producers of gold in the world. In 2014, they mined 130 tons of it. You can only imagine that with larger borders and more filled mines that the Incans would have gotten even more of it. But for the Incas, gold wasn't really that important, at least not the same way that it was important to the Spanish and to the Indo-Europeans. See, they couldn't use it as currency, they didn't have a monetary system. So what did they use it for? Well, gold instead was reserved for religion and art. They believed gold to be the sweat of the sun and silver to be the tears of the moon. And as a result, the Incas were expert goldsmiths, you know, fashioning jewelry and figurines and beautiful medallions adorned with jade to worship the gods. When they sacrificed people, a tradition that a lot of pre-Columbian civilizations seem to think was perfectly normal, the sacrifices, usually a boy and a girl, would take their figurines up to the priests before themselves being brutally sacrificed. So yeah, they liked gold. But the Europeans, they loved gold. To them, it was currency. It was power. It was beauty. The great alchemists of the time who predated our modern chemistry looked at gold as the perfection of matter because one, it was beautiful and two, it was so difficult to destroy or corrode in their experiments. So with gold having such a massive impact in European culture, it was the difference between generational wealth or generational poverty. And Francisco Pizarro wanted some. When Francisco Pizarro Gonzalez landed on the shores of the Inca Empire, the empire was struggling a lot already. They had endured a smallpox outbreak that had come from colonial Central America that had wiped out just about 90% of their population, including their emperor, Juana Capec, and his chosen successor, leaving Capec's two sons, Atahualpa and Huascar, to fight out for succession of the empire in a bloody civil war. After Atahualpa declared victory, Pizarro arrived. And Atahualpa, feeling pretty confident at this point, he had just quashed his brother in war and had pretty much negated all dissidents in his country, he wanted to go and meet these fair-skinned men adorned in metal. So they met in the town of Cajamarca, and in a tightly packed town square surrounded by his friends and soldiers, Atahualpa realized, though, that this wasn't going to be a friendly meeting. Pizarro and his men attacked Atahualpa and took him hostage. 
Realizing that what the men wanted was gold, he said, I can promise you more gold than you could possibly imagine. He told them that he would fill up a room of 20 feet by 15 feet by 8 feet of gold and twice that of silver if they would just let him go. They agreed, but they wanted the gold first. So as the coffers continued to fill, Atahualpa was planning his counterattack. He knew that the Incas outnumbered the Spanish by a lot, like a lot, and was planning how they were going to end up crushing this enemy. But the Spanish suspected Atahualpa and ended up executing him before the coffers were completely finished. And not too long after that, more Spanish soldiers arrived in Cajamarca. Soon after, the dismantling of the Inca Empire ensued and it was colonized for the Spanish. And with that, with one golden empire falling away into the oblivion of history, I think we should make a new one. So let's get into our drink. To begin the golden empire, I wanted to make something that was as South American and Peruvian as possible. And what came to mind to me was uh, essentially a South American gin fizz. And with that, let's begin our creation of our drink. So we're gonna put into our shaker here, we are going to put in uh, about a half ounce to three quarters of an ounce of passion fruit pulp. Now, fresh passion fruit for me is pretty expensive. I don't know about you, at least here in the States, it's pretty expensive. And luckily my girlfriend told me that at uh, Latin supermarkets or Latin grocery stores, they actually sell frozen uh, parts of this stuff. Uh, it normally looks like this, El Sembrador, um, and it's a lot more than you would get in fresh passion fruit and it's significantly cheaper. You can't really tell the difference in taste or texture. It's pure fruit pulp, so it's perfect. And uh, it's just fantastic. So if you have a Latin market near you and you want some passion fruit, this is the way I would go. There's plenty extra, use in some juices, it's delicious. But for our drink, we're gonna use about three quarters of an ounce here of our fresh passion fruit pulp. So pour that on in. Now, luckily too, this pulp also hails from Colombia, so that was still part of the empire at the time, so it fits right into our Incan theme here. Next, we're gonna follow that up with perhaps the national liquor of Peru. I don't think it actually is a national liquor, but I feel like it would be, and that is Pisco. Now, Pisco is distilled from grapes. It's typically made in the region of Ica, and it is delicious. It's a great mixer, a lot like vodka in that sense. It's around 42% alcohol, so it's got a pretty high proof, but this stuff is delicious. I absolutely love it. I'm using Santiago Cairolo. I apologize for the absolutely terrible pronunciation there to any Spanish speakers, um, but uh, this is really, really good stuff, and uh, we're gonna put in an ounce and a half. So I'll just pour that on out here. Like I said, this stuff is pretty dangerous. Uh, if you ever have a Pisco Sour, which is typically what you'll use this in, if it's not a Golden Empire, uh, you can suck those things down so easy, and then next thing you know, you're like, why am I on the floor? So you gotta be careful with this stuff. Next, we're going to follow that up with an egg white. As with all fizzes, you normally have an egg white in there. Now, I've pre-measured out uh, a little bit of egg white in here. Typically, the size of an egg white, if you separate it from the yolk, is going to be around three quarters of an ounce if you're not using fresh eggs. So we're going to measure out three quarters of an ounce right here. And then pour that on in. And then next, we're going to take our ice here in our tumbler and pour that on in. And then we're gonna give this a nice shake to give us some smooth frothiness. Ah, oh, that's a beautiful sound. It almost makes you deaf with excitement because I'm holding it right next to my ear but this is gonna look and taste amazing. Next, we're gonna put this into our sours glass that has been pre-rimmed. Now, I found some really, really cool things to help garnish this drink. Uh, on the rim, we have some lemon melted wafers that I actually found at Michael's. It's great, it's in their baking section. Um, really gives a great golden color. And then we put in some golden sprinkles as well and a little bit of golden sprinkles at the bottom because after all, it was just the hope of gold and just even the faintest touch of gold that brought the Spanish out to the mountains of the Andes and conquered the Incans. So, the end of the Incan Empire. Let's give this 
drink a pour and look at that beautiful that is fantastically just amazing fantastically is not even a word but that's how good it looks you know it just it's amazing it's frothy it's golden but it's not complete because this is supposed to be a south american version of a gin fizz this is the golden empire what is a fizz without the fizziness and for that let us go perhaps to the most famous of all peruvian colas inca cola now if you don't know about inca cola or have never heard of the golden cola uh it's actually perhaps the most famous and well-known cola that has come out of Peru, it was made in Peru, and it was so popular that it was purchased by Coca-Cola in 1999. Uh, so they've done pretty well for themselves, but we're gonna top off our drink here with some Inca Cola. And there you have it, the Golden Empire. And must I say that looks absolutely decadent. I think I would want to conquer a country just for that. Not really, that's not cool, but it looks like a pretty good drink. Let's give it a try. Mm. Oh yeah, it's so good. And you know, it's a little bit more subtle than you would initially imagine because we have a lot of bold flavors here, right? We do have the passion fruit, which is very tart uh, and kind of smacks you in the face a little bit with it. But uh, you also have the Pisco, which is very potent in alcohol content, but Pisco goes so well in mixing. It, it just masks itself so well uh, and it, is delicious in that regard. The maracuya or the passion fruit is tremendously diluted, I guess you could say, or at least it's toned down by the introduction of the egg white, but not to a point that it's not there, it's just reserved. And with the added silky frothiness of the egg white, it's a very mellow, very chill, very almost refined experience. Uh, I love the mouthfeel of this drink. Uh, as far as the rim is concerned, it's really good. It doesn't actually uh, take away from the, the tart flavors of the passion fruit, um, but it does a good job of putting in a little bit of a lemony sweetness to it. And then of course you had that Inca Cola with its subtle champagne -y flavor and also that very necessary carbonation. It's a really well-balanced drink and hopefully one that I think is uh, doing justice to the former golden empire of the Incas. And that sounds like last call. So with an empire so big and vast, and yet they didn't have a method of writing down anything, how did the Peruvians, or the Incans, should I say, uh, manage their vast empire? Well, it all came down to string and knots. Uh, the quipu, as it's better known, uh, was their accounting system, kind of like, almost like a, a wearable abacus, I guess you could say, would be a somewhat accurate uh, comparison in terms of how they were able to manage all the vast different numbers. So they had these large strings, some of them were color-coded, other of them had very particular types of knots in order to indicate different areas of information. And they also had particular experts, Kipu Kamaios, who were the ones that were tasked with managing and measuring everything throughout the empire. They were kind of like the accountants and the scribes and the storytellers throughout the entire of the Incan empire. Because these knots and all of the information that is recorded on the Kipu didn't just measure the amount of people, it wasn't just necessarily the amount of livestock, it wasn't just a numbers game, it was also a way for them to maintain their history. Because certain colors or certain knots would reflect certain folk tales and stories. And as you went through the beads or the knots, then you would retell the story of the Incan people. And that's how they managed to go through the entirety of their history. And they were also able to manage being able to build their incredible roads or being able to uh, gather their forces or measure anything. It's pretty a remarkable way of measuring things that is so non-European, I guess you could say. It's so foreign to us nowadays to think that it's like, all right, it's not just a ruler. It's like, no, I've got this tassel of beads 
uh, or should I say knots, it's really knots. I have this tassel of knots that's in my hands and with this I can not only measure how many people are in your family, I can also tell you the story of our forefathers. I can also tell you how to build a house. And this is just one of the many ways that the Incans were able to show just how ingenious they were. Despite the fact that they didn't have the conventional technology of the Europeans or other cultures, they were still able to accomplish just as much and in even more impressive ways. And for that, it is truly remarkable. Thank you all so much for watching. If you'd like to check out any of our other historically inspired cocktails, you can find them here, or you can also find them at topshelfhistory.com. We're also on Rumble. Uh, also check out our locals, please. Uh, that's for our premium content, for our after hours, and for our behind the bars. Pretty much everything that is going to be our premium content for our patrons will be there. So please consider giving that a check out if you enjoy the content. But before I go and finally sign off for sure, I do want to bring to y'all's attention that we are actually coming out with uh, some recipe cards. Now these recipe cards are fantastic. We have recipe cards for our drinks for season one. Uh, this here is the Lone Star that I'm holding in my hand. On the front you can see that it's got all of the uh, ingredients and how to make it and then on the back it's got the history that inspired it. Something that we're pretty proud of and let me say this stuff is really useful. I've definitely used it myself when I'm trying to recreate my drinks and it's pretty fantastic fantastic. Now, mind you, with a good drink, I've also, every once in a while, became pretty peckish and wanted some good food to go along with it. And for that, we actually were able to partner up with a chef friend of ours to create uh, recipes, food recipes, for every single drink in season one as well. Uh, so we also have recipe cards for that, 16 unique different recipes, food recipes, along with the drink recipes. On the front is more of our uh, pairing and history, and then on the back for the food is uh, the uh, ingredients and how to make it. it these are so special, guys. Uh, it's really cool. There was so much work and love put into them. Uh, we tried every single recipe and let me tell you they're all insanely good uh chef tanya is amazing uh she has uh such a tremendous culinary talent and um these are great pairings. Uh, we're also coming out with a complete recipe book if you guys wanted to get the full season one, uh, if you just wanted the drinks, if you just wanted the food, if you want the two together, those options will be available as well. Uh, just keep an eye out for our social media to see when we actually post those things. Feel free to sign up for our email list if you want to get more notifications on that or follow us on Instagram. Now, one of the great things too, uh, last thing I wanted to say about these recipe cards is that uh, we do the individual recipe cards because hey you know you may find just one drink that you really really liked and you want to uh, know how to make that drink and keep the recipe card and always reference it this is perfect for that and the food pairing goes so well with it too I really hope you guys consider getting these it would do so much uh, to support us and just bring us so much joy share us uh, share with us you guys making it it's you know uh, so special for us to be able to provide these things for you guys and we really hope that you enjoy them but from all of us here at Top Shelf History. I hope that you guys know that we love you and remember, history is better with a drink. Cheers.